two cars, both advanced for their time. Both were a gamble intended for new markets from well-established independent manufacturers. But each car led to the downfall of its parent company. Jowett's Javelin and the Roots Group's Imp. In 1952, Super Snipe Mark III bought it in 1956. If I'd been married then, I probably wouldn't have had it. <laughs> <laughs> John Easton bought his Super Snipe from a Lord Mayor for £650. Roots took over the Humber and Hillman car companies in the 20s and started building the Super Snipe in the 30s. They weren't in the same class as a Rolls, more your politician's or film star's car. And John, a cinema projectionist, saw these stars every day on the big screen. His leading lady was his very own super snipe. The car was his whole life, his pride and joy. It was quite a standard joke, really, that he'd part with me long before he'd part with the car. <laughs> John used the car as the family runaround. The difference was, this car could carry more than one family. Oh, I suppose we must have had eight or nine in it when we used to go and visit my sister in Romford. Mother, Grandma, me, you, and children. Barbara, Sometimes we had Ian, Barbara's yeah. children. And with so many in the car, it left little room for the pram. John much preferred to take all the wheels off of the pram and put it all back together again when we arrived anywhere, rather than get rid of this car and have a sensible car. <laughs> well, I thought we, we wouldn't have a pram forever, would we? But once the car had gone, it had gone. The Humber's luxurious pre-war design was out of place in post-war Britain but it gave Roots some style. I'll open the bonnet. Four litre side valve. Nice plodder. Plenty of room to work, but the easiest way I've found is to actually get in the engine and then you can work on the rear, which is very handy when it's raining. The interior is trimmed with leather, Bakelite and enamel paint. That slight noise there is the heater. Let me turn that off, the blower. It's very quiet clock, you can't hear it ticking. The wipers, you can either have one or two. But sitting here, you don't really need that one. Beautiful. Real wood, not plastic. Today, they couldn't afford to build it like this. It's all nuts and bolts. I think it's remarkable, really. No cigarette lighters. Cigar lighters in Humbers. But cigar-smoking Humber buyers were getting harder to find. It was expensive to build, a reliable, if dated, throwback to a lost era. Root's basic Hillman cars were badged as Humber or Sunbeam. This way, a range of family cars could be assembled more cheaply. But for many, the spirit of Root's flagship mark had been lost. Humber Scepter, it's a nice Hillman, but um, <laughs> it's still got the Humber name on it. To 
capture the growing market for sporty family cars, Roots launched the Sunbeam Rapier in 1955. Eight years later, Harold Morris parted with £800 for his. I felt it was very much ahead of its time in looks. It didn't look like many cars did, a box with wheels on four corners. The rapiers show off their handling on the fast and frightening left hand. It was a sports version of the Hillman Minx. Ten years after the Jarrett Javelin had won its class at the Monte Carlo Rally, the rapier won the team prize at the same event. Harold, a headmaster, bought his because he had his own European rally in mind for the school holidays. I was wanting to do some touring on the continent and I thought that uh, if the rapier would uh, perform well on the Monte Carlo Rally, it would do for me. It's uh, quite a normal four-cylinder engine, 1592cc. It's got twin Stromberg uh, carbs, which give it quite uh, good acceleration and speed. That's <laughs> supposedly the heating system, but it never was very efficient. It was quite a cold car in the winter. I like these um, two side grills. They were, of course, ventilators, and it's possible to shut them from the inside if necessary. Another feature I liked about it was the fact that both windows wind down and give it a, well, I, I think, a very sporting look. And it's ideal, that is, for touring in, uh, in warm weather. Another attractive feature, I think, is the walnut dashboard. This is a speedometer, of course, with the um, mileage on it, except that you have to add 100,000 onto that. <laughs> this is the, um, the demister, which again, um, well, we won't say anything about that. <laughs> Harold, his wife Biddy and daughter Jo, drove to Yugoslavia in the rapier, four years running. Just getting to Dover took most of the first day. We left home at 3 a.m. It was a fine morning. We joined the M1 at Daventry. And we kept up a steady 65 to 70 miles an hour. And we were at Marble Arch just after 7 a.m. I know Biddy was not too keen on setting off in the middle of the I night. I say I've liked, I've enjoyed leaving home, you see. And in the, in the early hours of the morning, it was always worse. But it was always one of these sort of times that Harold chose that we must go, you see. So, of course, we all did as we were told. <laughs> Traffic was heavy, and it really is worthwhile leaving home a couple of hours earlier. I knew where I wanted to get to that day, and that was it. He was anxious, really, to get there. But I didn't want to spend more than three days getting there, you see. And we went to Sarajevo in Herd, and we were surrounded by crowds of children as soon as we got there, looking at the car and looking at us and looking at our daughter and saying, what an excellent car you have. What an excellent what daughter, daughter you have. <laughs> yeah. I think it was the one phrase they'd learned. Yeah. <laughs> it was quite an adventure, really. Although the Minx line was popular, Roots only had 10% of the market. They wanted more, and so built a bigger family car, the Super Minx. For Dave Stanton, it was the start of an ongoing love affair. I was sitting in the office one day and my boss turned to me and said, a young lad like you ought to be driving a convertible. It started me looking and I eventually saw this uh, Super Minx convertible in the garage in Wolverhampton and uh, I liked it straight away. We used to go abroad in it. We went to uh, Spain three times, touring with the hood down. We had some good times in it, yeah. yes. It was brilliant, really. We caught it for 
three years, didn't we? You did, yes. yes three, yeah. three and a half years. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think the first two or three uh, continental holidays were during our courting years. We used to borrow a tent off the same boss that uh, advised me to buy a convertible in the first place. And uh, we used to be able to get it up in, uh, in an hour and a meal on all within an hour. I was a hairdresser at the time. So that was when all the bouffant hairdos were around and the flick ups and... You used to wear all your head scarves as well, didn't you? Yes, yes, yeah. used to have a, a pile of head scarves matching what I was wearing. This is one of them and uh, just I've got to imagine the pink curls and the flick ups <laughs> all around the edge, but uh, that's it, and then we were away then. <laughs> With so many memories linked to the car, Dave couldn't bring himself to sell it. This is the original Hillman Superminx convertible. I drove it for about 10 years and then put it in store here, and it's been here now for 23 years. And although it's out of the weather and under cover, it's uh, suffered quite badly from mildew inside. A mouse built his nest in the boot there, but that's only to be expected when it's been stored for so long. It wouldn't take too much work to put it back on the road again. And if he needs spares for the restoration, he's got a barn full. I've got about 20 Superminx doors, and there's about 15 or 18 Superminx windscreens here. I've never had a windscreen break on me in 35 years, but I always keep them just in case. Sooner or later, I'm going to have to have a bit of a clear out in here, I think. I've just put a new battery on the car and I'm going to try and start it up, but... Uh... No, I don't think we're going to get any luck. I'll give it another try. After 23 years, it's a bit too much to expect, even Hillman, to start. Oh, well, there's probably the right spare somewhere in the loft. But routes were dependent on the badge-engineered Hillmans and the ageing Super Snipe range that had been first thought of in the 30s. Like Jowett, they tried something new. Tim Fry and his colleague thought they had the answer. We thought we could design exactly the car everybody wanted, and we went to see the director of engineering. He said, all right, get on with it then. And so we left his office and looked at each other and said, what on earth have we done? Uh, but we said we'd do it, and we're British, so we have to do it. Like the Javelin, this car was radical for its day. It had an aluminium engine in the rear and independent suspension. It was built in a brand new factory, not in Coventry, but on Clydeside in Scotland. The economies of this move proved hard to justify, with parts shipped north from the Midlands and the finished car, the Hillman Imp, shipped south again. That's it, my duck pole. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> For Barbara Pearson, it was simply the car she wanted. After her first in 1968, she replaced it with her current in in 1973. I call her Dinky. That's her name because she is Dinky. She's just sort of nice and compact. She's got everything you know that I think a car needs, and uh, that's it. Speed. She's good on petrol, very good on petrol. But I never use one of these pumps. I wouldn't know how to use it. A man tried to show me once. I said, oh, don't bother. I said, oh, life's too difficult for that. And I'll go somewhere else, and I did. <laughs> he looked amazed, of course, the fact that I should refuse this petrol, but... Here we are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As well as being good on petrol, the imp had lively acceleration and quite a bit of power. Woof, she's off at the lights without any hesitation, as long as you've got in the right gear, of course. 
It amazes me how slow some people are, which I think causes accidents. I haven't got time for people who are still tiddling about at traffic lights. I'm miles away, usually, before they've even changed gear. And they think, what, cheeky little imp, because that's what they were called, did you know that? The cheeky imp. Being built on Clydeside, the Cheeky Imp was isolated from the rest of the Roots factories in Coventry. Despite a pioneering design, imp production remained difficult and expensive. Just as Jowett's decision to build in Bradford destroyed the Javelin, so Roots' move to Scotland sealed the fate of their imp, and eventually of the whole company. I think it's a shame they ever stopped making them. I really am. But they did, and that's it.